I am so excited about this series. There hasn't been a series that, I've been, that I have been more excited about than what we're going to be doing. Now listen, not over four weeks. I'm going to go an extra week. We're going to go five weeks in this series, which will take us right up to Easter. There is so much material to cover that I just couldn't get it in in four weeks, even though I tried. So, I hope that you'll find it interesting, helpful, and uh, it will be a bit political. So you need to understand that to start with. I hope that doesn't bother anybody, but I don't believe in the separation of church and state. Okay. It's not in the Constitution. I want to pray and ask God just to bless our time and our study today. Father God, just thank you for the privilege of teaching. And Lord, as we look at what's going on in the world today, and then we compare it with what's happening in your scriptures, we just see, God, how relevant the word of God is. And Lord, we look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. And as we see these things happening, we wonder, Lord, you're coming soon. And we hope so. And we believe so. So honor the teaching, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're already three months into 2019. And with every year that passes, we are one year closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many signs that the Bible gives us concerning the time when Jesus Christ is going to return. Now, we don't know the year. We don't know the month. We don't know the day. But we can know the season. And the season is depicted according to signs which are found in the Word of God. And so over the next five weeks, I'm going to give you 14 signs right out of what's happening in the world today and show you that what's happening in the world today is found in Scripture, not only in Scripture, but everything has to do with end time events. I believe we need to be like the sons of Ishakar. Ishakar, of course, was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. But the tribe of, Je of Ishakar was responsible for the Jewish calendar. And so the Bible says concerning them, they had an understanding of the times. And because they had an understanding of the times, they were able to know what Israel was to do. I believe that we need to be discerners of the times. I believe we need to have an understanding of what's going on in world affairs today. And if we have a good understanding of Scripture, we're going to say, wow, this is really in the Word of God? I think this series of five lessons is going to strengthen your faith in Bible prophecy. It's going to strengthen your confidence in the relevance of the Word of God. And it's going to prepare you all the more for the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the goal of these next five weeks. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready? First thing I want to talk about is the scorning of nationalism and the celebrating of globalism. President Trump has repeatedly referred to himself as a nationalist, which has caused him much, uh, much scorn from progressives in our country as well as from world leaders. In an interview with Laura Ingram this past October the 29th, she asked Trump, what does nationalism mean to you? Here's Trump's reply. It means I love this country. It means I'm fighting for the country. I'm somebody who wants to take care of our country because for many years, our leaders have been more worried about the world than they have about the United States and they leave us in a mess. Whether it's wars, whether it's the economy, whether it's debt, whether it's all of the things that they have done, including putting the wrong people on the Supreme Court, I am proud of our country, and I call that nationalism. I am not a globalist. I want to take care of the globe, but first I have to take care of our country. French President Emmanuel Macron, in his November address to world leaders in Paris, denounced Trump's speech on nationalism, calling it, quote, a betrayal of moral values. Patriotism is the exact opposite of nationalism, he said. Nationalism is a betrayal of patriotism. 
by pursuing our own interests first with no regard for others, we erase the very thing a nation holds most precious, that which gives it it life and makes it great, its moral values. Now, Macron is a globalist who views Trump's America First policy as equivalent to the unbridled nationalism in the 1930s that opened the way for the rise of Adolf Hitler. Now, before we get into talking about what globalism is all about, let me say this. Our God is a nationalist. Our God puts the nation of Israel first. To him, it is Israel first. Notice what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning at verse 6. Moses is talking to the children of Israel. He's saying, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the peoples. Time and time again, God refers to Israel as my people and as my loved one. God puts Israel first above all the other nations that have existed, and as a result, I am saying that our God is a nationalist. Dennis Prager, in discussing nationalism on his talk show, said this, To me, there's no difference between being a nationalist and being a patriot. They are one and the same. I agree. The problem is we are losing the spirit of patriotism in this country. One reason why we have a flag up here is because some people in this class said, we need to have the American flag in this class. And Ted went out and bought a flag and put it here because we believe in the United States of America. We are patriots in this class. We're not putting our country above God, of course not. But we ought to put our country above all other countries in the world. We need to love this nation of ours. And yet what's happening in our society today, a new YouGov poll found younger generations, that is millennials and the Gen Z, are less likely to love and respect this country. They are less informed about American history and way more likely to embrace socialism. Now get this. More than 50% of high schoolers surveyed say they do not consider themselves patriotic. They are more likely to approve of athletes kneeling in protest during the national anthem and less likely to show respect for the flag. We have raised a generation whose hero is Colin Kaepernick, who despises our flag and has no respect for our police by wearing socks portraying police as pigs. And he is the poster child for Nike. When a country loses its patriotic spirit, the spirit of America first, there's a great danger of it going the way of the Roman Empire. There are a variety of reasons for Rome's collapse, among them being, after 200 years of Pax Romana, where the citizens of the Roman Empire felt safe and secure under the strong hand of Rome, Invaders began to enter Rome who were indifferent to Roman politics and Roman government. They were not patriotic. And this lack of patriotism worked its way into the Roman military and weakened it until Rome fell to their invaders. To be a patriot is to be a nationalist. But world leaders see things differently. Macron sees a nationalist is one who puts his country first and hates all other countries. It sees it as the cause of elitism and xenophobia. Globalists see all nations as equal with the need to work together to make for a better world. Well, that sounds good. In globalism, nations lose their national sovereignty and nations are without borders. Globalism is where people identify themselves as citizens of the world and in our nation's case not citizens of the United States of America. 
Do you realize, I just learned this, this last week, so it's not in your notes. Recently, 136 countries signed out to having no borders, where you can go from one country to the other without the need of a passport, without the need of a visa. 136 countries are saying, hey, we want to eliminate all borders. Now understand something. God established the nations of the world. You read that in the book of Genesis. And the Apostle Paul tells us in a sermon that he gave to the philosophers in Athens, God established the borders for all the nations of the world. And what we have today are globalists out there who say, let's erase all the borders. There's a reason for that, and we're going to get to it. Globalism is the goal of world leaders like French President Emmanuel Macron. He's so committed to globalism that just recently he proposed a 10-nation coalition army to defend Europe and her interests worldwide. Macron believes Europe can no longer depend on the United States to defend Europe as long as Trump is president of the United States because he has this spirit of nationalism. It was Dennis Prager who wrote, Patriotism is usually a euphemism for chauvinism. That is, it is immoral to think of your nation as better than any other nation. That's political correctness gone amuck. According to Scripture, globalism will ultimately lead to a one-world government under the Antichrist. Now, now we're going to get into the Scripture. I've, I've set the background for you. Now, what does the Word of God have to say about this? John the Revelator, uh, John the Revelator writes of a time when the Antichrist comes to power. In a vision from the Lord, notice this is Revelation 13. He says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the sea, this, this is a beast coming up out of the sea. It has seven heads, ten horns. But what does the sea represent? Well, the Bible tells us, Revelation 17, verse 15, the sea refers to the nations of the world. So here you have a beast coming up out of the nations of the world. Obviously, if it's reference to the nations of the world, they have to be Gentile nations. It cannot be a reference to Israel. So the Antichrist is not Jewish. The Antichrist is not going to come out of Israel. The Antichrist is going to come out of the Gentile nations of the world. And I believe the Antichrist is going to come out of a revived Roman Empire, which is seen today in the European Union. I'll set that up. Hey, this will be a good review from our study of the book of Revelation. So some of the things we talked about in the book of Revelation, we spent a whole year in that book. Hey, you'll, you'll get a little recap today. Now, what do the seven heads on this beast represent? They represent seven empires, the text tells us, that have and will hold the Jewish people in captivity. And the ten horns represent ten kings who will be subordinate rulers under the Antichrist. This beast not only represents the Antichrist, but also represents the one world government over which the Antichrist will rule. You cannot separate the Antichrist from the empire of the Antichrist. John goes on to say that this beast and his empire is greater, get this now, greater than the leaders and the empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece combined. So, when the Antichrist comes to power and rules over a one world government, it is going to be a strong government, stronger than the empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece combined. He tells us the power and authority of this beast comes from Satan, who is described as a dragon. An interesting article appeared in the American Thinker, which stated that the United Nations wants a one world government by the year 2030 or before. Do you realize that's only 11 years from now? The goal of the United Nations is to bring about a one-world government within the next 11 years. 
Some of us may not be around here then. Some of you may well be if the Lord does not come first. So here's what we're saying. There's coming a one world government and it begins with world leaders choosing globalism over nationalism. However, these secular government leaders will not see their supposed paradise. Why? Because this is going to happen during the time of the Great Tribulation. See? And you know what? Whoa! We, as the church, are going to be out of here before the Great Tribulation comes. I'm saying we're getting close to the rapture of the church. It's not that far away. Well, you see, they're going to think this is going to be a time of great paradise when there's going to be a one world government under the rule of the Antichrist. And as you have learned, you who have come through uh, my teaching on the book of Revelation, if, if you remember, that is going to be the worst time in the history of mankind. That's what Jesus said. The wrath of God is going to be poured out on this earth once the Antichrist comes to power. But the whole issue here is the move toward globalism, the removal of borders, where you can just go from Germany to France, and you, know, and you can do that today. It's exactly what happens in the European Union. Kathy and I were in Europe last year. We went from Germany to France, and we remember our director saying, look, no passport, no visa, we just crossed the border. It's like going from California to Nevada. Now, she didn't say that. I'm saying that. But you get the point. Now, what I'm going to talk about may seem to be the exact opposite of what I have just said. But if you are patient with me, I will wrap it all up and show you how both of what I have said and what I'm going to say is in Scripture. We want to talk about the instability of the European Union. With the rise of a one world government through globalism, the European Union has been destabilized by the rise of the nationalist movement where people want to take back their national sovereignty. Brexit, the removal of Great Britain from EU, was to take place this March the 29th. It's not going to happen now because Theresa May well, she's brought some proposals before Parliament, and Parliament has turned it down. So, they've put it on hold. But most people believe it's going to happen. How it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, we don't know. But Great Britain is going to remove itself from the European Union. Two years ago, the Brits voted to leave the EU. Pro-Brexit advocates have framed leaving the EU as necessary to protect and restore the country's identity, namely its culture, independence, and place in the world. This argument is often expressed by opposition to immigration, especially Muslim immigration, where Muslims have taken over parts of England with no-go zones and Sharia law. When Kathy and I were on an ocean cruise to the Panama Canal, few years back. I sat on uh, right across from a man from Birmingham, England. And this man said to me, uh, you people in the United States had better be careful. You better have your eyes open because the Muslims are invading our nation and they're taking over parts of our country. They have these no-go zones all over Great Britain. And it is a dangerous thing for you even to go into one of these no-go zones if you are not a Muslim because your life is in danger. And they even practice Sharia law. They have a law that supersedes the law of Great Britain. Do you realize in New York City and other places around the world, the Muslims now have their own police cars and their own police department and they are policing their own no-go zones wherever they are. And the purpose of that is to keep out anybody who is a non-Muslim. I watched a video just yesterday of Dearborn, Michigan. Look at it. The whole city is Muslim. 
You can't find English on any of the buildings. And they operate Sharia law in that city. In our own nation. Now let me say this. Uh, what happened in New Zealand this last week was evil and it was a tragedy. I don't think it's the responsibility of anybody to murder Muslims to get even with what Muslims have done in terms of terrorist activities. We are to love these people. They are created in the image and likeness of God. We are to love them as people, but we are to hate their philosophy. And by the way, if they are terrorists, the Bible would say we are to hate them too. Keep this in mind. Psalm chapter 5 says this. There are people whom God hates. Now that's a shock. There are people whom God hates. So we don't have to love everybody. We don't have to love a terrorist. We don't have to forgive a terrorist. But what happened in New Zealand, I'm saying, is evil and wrong. We are not to go out and kill our Muslim neighbors. In fact, three doors down from where we live, there's a Muslim family. They're very nice. We don't talk to them very much, but they walk their kids in front of my house, and I say hi to them. Ah, hi to me. You know, it's nice. Okay. We had a lady from England that visited our class this past December. And after the class, she's talking to my wife, and she's saying, Ah, oh, man, you can't believe what's going on over in England in regards to Islam. And my wife says, well, well, my husband has given several lectures on Islam in this class. And I've been here teaching 11 years, so over these 11-year periods of time, I've, I've done at least uh, seven or eight or nine different lectures on Islam. And she says, oh, would your husband send me the notes? And I said, uh, yes, I would. I'd, I'd send them to her. So here's the email that she sends back to me. This is just a part of the email. Notice that she refers to my lectures as a document, but she says, this document has given me goosebumps. It is so true and relevant. I cannot believe God has had someone put this on paper. I witness with every word. Ron, when I got on the plane to come here to the States, God said to me, this trip is my gift to you, and I have been looking for his greater purpose for being here, not just to see family. As I look at the people in the UK whom I no have been silenced over the years. I have to believe a time is coming when the Lord will open their mouths. So many of God's people have been injured and beaten down over the years, but God will not leave them there. He always has. He has hidden ones for times like this. Bless you for all of your years of research. I love the details and all the background information about Islam. What this woman was saying is that she's a supporter of Brexit. She is a nationalist. And she wants England to regain its national sovereignty, to not depend on Brussels for direction on how to lead a country, but to depend upon the people whom she elects to Parliament. As you know, uh, Wales has uh, supported Brexit. Brexit. Scotland has voted to remain in the EU, and this has caused some of the division in the UK. And so right now, it's not united. All across Europe, nationalism is on the rise, and far-right parties have made significant electoral gains. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, in a speech delivered last August in Romania, said he wants to destroy the liberal order of the EU from within. He has declared next year's election, that would be this year now because he's speaking last year, 2018. So there's going to be elections this year in the European Parliament. That would be the moment, he says, the right-wing nationalist wave would achieve its victory over liberal elites who are out to transform Europe, he says, to ship it into post-Christian era and into an era when nations disappear. Do you realize Hungary has put up a wall around their country to keep the immigrants out because they've been overrun? And crime has dropped 
dramatically in Hungary because of the wall. The president of Hungary is a nationalist. European Council President Donald Tusk delivered a speech this past November stating that nationalism will be, notice, a fundamental threat to the European Union. Now, this is something I just noticed this last week. I just found it, not in your notes. 86% of Europeans do not feel attached to Brussels, which is the capital of the European Union. See, in England, the capital is what? London. In Germany, the capital is what? Uh, Frankfurt. In Paris, that's the capital of France. So, in England, somebody, hey, I have more respect for London as my capital. In Germany, I have more respect for Frankfurt as my capital. In France, I have more respect for Paris as my capital, not Brussels. I don't even feel attached to Brussels, and yet it's Brussels that's the capital of the entire European Union. And countries are answerable to Brussels. Then you have the Yellow Vest movement who have rioted and set fires for weeks in Paris. This movement was motivated by rising fuel prices, the high cost of living, and claims that a disproportionate burden of the government's tax reforms are falling on the middle classes. They are also demanding the resignation of globalist and French President Emmanuel Macron. They're, they're, they're rioting every weekend. It's happening even today. It's spreading throughout Europe. And one of the movements here is we are nationalists, and we want to get rid of those who are running our country that are globalists. So, then this sounds quite the opposite of what we just talked about, right? We've talked about the move toward globalism, and now we're talking about the move toward nationalism. How do we put all of this together? Hang in there. I'm going to tell you. So what does the instability of the European Union have to do with Bible prophecy? It is the belief of most premillennial Bible scholars that the one world government will ultimately come out of a revived Roman Empire, which today would include the European Union. This understanding comes from the book of Daniel, where Daniel reveals himself, uh, reveals the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which took place in 606 BC. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He sees this statue. And the head of the statue is gold. And the arms and chest of this statue are silver. And the belly and the thighs of this statue are bronze. And the two legs on this statue are iron. And then you have feet and ten toes on this statue. Now get this. The feet and the ten toes are made of what? Clay mixed with iron. They do not cohere. Okay? Now, the dream goes on. Then Nebuchadnezzar in this dream sees this entire image. Then he sees a stone cut out of the side of a mountain without hands. That stone rolls down the side of the mountain, crushes the image at its feet. And the stone fills the entire earth. Now, Daniel is interpreting this. Here, here Nebuchadnezzar, is what you saw. The head on this statue, this head of gold, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. That's Babylon. But you're not going to rule the world forever. No, because the Medes and the Persians are going to come, and they're going to conquer the Babylonians. And that's the arms and the chest of silver. Notice, two arms, Medes, Persians. But the Medes and the Persians aren't going to rule the world forever. They're going to be conquered by Alexander the Great of Greece. And the Greeks are going to come along. And they are the belly and the thighs on this statue. But the Greeks aren't going to rule the world forever. The Romans are going to come. They're going to conquer the Greeks. And if you remember, the Roman Empire was divided. You have two legs on this image of iron. But how about these feet and how about these toes? What's that? Hang in there. Hang in there. And then, what does uh, Daniel say? 
He says, this, this stone that's cut out of the side of a mountain without hand and rolls down the mountain and crushes the image. And then that stone just fills the whole earth. He says, that stone is the kingdom of God. It's going to fill the whole earth. When Jesus Christ comes back again, he comes back to rule and reign over this earth. And we as the church are going to rule and reign with him. He's going to sit on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. Well, you might uh, remember your history under Emperor Diocletian in the year 395 A.D. The Roman Empire was divided into Eastern and Western Rome. That explains the two legs on this image. And then you have the feet and the ten toes, which partly are of iron and partly are clay. Notice how Daniel puts this. He says, the clay and the iron mixture will mingle with the seed of men, but it will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. Rather, the kingdom shall be divided. Whoa. Whatever comes out of the Roman Empire is going to be weak, brittle. It won't hold together. It's going to divide. So once the feet and the toes on the image begin to crumble, there will be a stone cut from the side of a mountain without hands, and it will crush the image at its feet and fill the whole earth. That stone is the coming of the Messiah and his millennial reign on earth. So what are we to make now of the feet and the ten toes made partly of iron and partly of clay? Follow me on this. Very, very significant. The Roman Empire collapsed in the year 476 A.D., and from out of it came ten nations which eventually formed Europe. Here they are. The Huns, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Suebi, the Vandals, the Burgundians, the Heruli, the Anglo-Saxon, and the Lombard. This is the beginning of Spain, the beginning of France, the beginning of Italy, the beginning of Great Britain. Ten nations came out of the Roman Empire once the Roman Empire fell, and these ten nations became Europe. I find it interesting that Europe was first formed from ten nations that broke away from Rome. These ten nations are all part of the European Union today, which consists of 28 nations, keeping Great Britain in. Now notice this. Of the 28 nations that presently comprise the European Union, 10 would be considered iron and 18 would be considered clay. If you're in Germany, that's iron. If you're in France, that's iron. If you're in Great Britain, that's iron. If you're in Greece, that's clay. If you're in Italy, that's clay. We were in Italy just last year. And there was talk, what about Italy pulling out of the European Union? We were in Greece a few years before that. The guide was telling us Greece is, considered, is considering pulling out of the European Union. Here's Great Britain. We want to pull out of the European Union. Europe was formed from ten nations. Those ten nations are the ten toes on the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And they're made of iron mixed with clay. They're brittle, and eventually they're going to fall apart. Furthermore, we need to understand that the, the EU is on shaky ground. There's a lot of rioting going on. Did you see what the, the pictures there in regards to uh, the yellow vesters and so forth? There are serious economic problems taking place in many of those countries. There's uh, falling uh, living standards. There's deepening cuts in state services. These nations are also facing the brunt of the disintegration of Syria and Iraq, which has set a tidal wave of Muslim refugees crashing over into Europe via Italy, Greece, and Macedonia. The immigration of Muslims into Europe is causing a major division in the European Union. Germany is pressing member nations to take in more refugees. Poland, Austria, Hungary, and Italy are aggressively saying no to Angela Merkel. 
We don't want any more. We have enough. The relationship between these nations and Germany has become frigid. We have seen this past uh, year, 2018, where nationalism in Europe is on the march and globalism is trying to hang on. Don't be surprised if more nations drop out of the EU in years to come. I think Great Britain is going to drop out. More nations are going to drop out in the years to come. It's too brittle. It's too fragile. It is truly a union of iron and clay, and they do not mix, and they cannot hold together. The partial collapse of the EU will make her right for the coming Antichrist who will reinstate globalism and a one-world government. Now, I've just given you two seemingly contradictory ideas here. What's going on in Europe? You have this globalist movement, you have this nationalist movement, and you know what? The Bible prophesies both of them. The nationalist movement, those ten toes that are made of iron and clay, the European Union, which is so brittle it's going to fall apart. Why is it going to collapse? Why is it going to fall apart? Because there is a rivalry between nationalism and globalism, and those who are nationalist are going to get out. The Bible says that. All in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and his ten toes on that image. On the other hand, you have globalism. You see that in Merkel. You see that in uh, Macron. You see that in other nations in the European Union. They want globalism. And when the European Union begins to crumble, what happens? Notice that dream again. There's a stone that is carved out of the side of a mountain. That stone rolls down the mountain, crashes the image, and that stone fills the whole earth. That is the kingdom of God. When you see the European Union begin to collapse, you know the day of the Lord is right at hand, coming at any moment. And then the Antichrist comes, and what does he do? He puts everything back together again. The one world government is a globalist government, no borders. You see how relevant the word of God is. We are living in the end times, and it's time, it's time that the church speaks up on things that I'm talking about today. We need to alert people what is going on in the world and how it relates to Bible prophecy. And too many churches are silent on this. I will tell you, I will tell you that outside of a couple churches I know, no one, no one is talking about what I'm telling you today. But then my purpose is to tell you what's not being talked about. That's what makes this class interesting, I hope. <laughs> now, th this last thing I want to talk about, this is exciting. You know, I, we, we've talked about some negative things. I, I want to end positively. I want to end with you saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen. I want you clapping. I want you excited because that's how we're going to end this thing. I'm not promising every lesson we do is going to end positively. Because the news in the world isn't always good, is it? Okay. Let's talk about Israel's uh, 70th anniversary as a nation and the moving of the United States Embassy to Jerusalem. Isaac Newton said this. Remember, Isaac Newton was not only a Christian. Isaac Newton was a diligent studier of Bible prophecy. He says, about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. What Isaac Newton said is absolutely true. Those of us who interpret the Bible literally those of us who are teachers of Bible prophecy and take the Bible for exactly what it says are being criticized today. There's a lot of opposition to what I'm telling you. Because the liberals out there, 
don't want you to hear what, what, what the Bible actually is teaching us. Well, as we said, Newton proved to be right. Once the Bible became accessible in printed form and in national languages, people began to interpret it for, it, for its plain sense meaning. That's exactly how I interpret the Bible, for its plain sense meaning. 400 years ago, in the late 16th century, the Puritans began to apply literal interpretation to Bible prophecy, resulting in the conclusion that in the end time, God will regather the Jewish people in unbelief and reestablish the state of Israel. And one of the best known English Puritan theologians was a man by the name of John Owen, who died in the year 1683. Here's what he wrote. The Jews shall be gathered from all parts of the earth where they are scattered and brought home to their homeland. He's reading the Bible. And he's saying, the Bible says, here's the Jews. The Jews were scattered all over the world in 1683. And the Bible says they're going to return to their homeland and they're going to become a nation again. The Puritans understood that. The Jewish people are God's chosen people who were to be a witness to the world. They were warned by Moses if they were not faithful to the covenant that God made with them at Sinai, they would be scattered from one end of the earth to the other. Actually, Moses is even more detailed than that in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Notice what he says. You Jews, you've got a covenant with God. You, you've agreed that you're going to obey God. That God alone is going to be your God, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the moment you break that covenant, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a nation of people that are going to come and take you into captivity. These people speak a language that you don't even understand. Who was that? You could say the Assyrians, you can say the Babylonians, both. But you're going to return to your homeland again. You're going to come back. God's not going to leave you there forever. But the second time, if you still don't obey, if you still don't honor the covenant, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be scattered from one end of the earth to the other. But you'll come back. And notice this. When you're scattered from one end of the earth to the other, you're going to be a persecuted people. Notice what uh, Moses says. This is Deuteronomy 28, 65. Among the nations you will find no rest, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. Hmm. Don't we see a lot of uh, anti-Semitism in the world today? How about in our Congress? Do you realize the state of, I think, Mrs., uh, Michigan, rather, the Democrats in Michigan want to get rid of their Democratic Muslim congresswoman because she is making a fool of herself and they are embarrassed. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. God promised after their dispersion that their land would become desolate and their cities become waste. So once the, once the Jewish people are out of their land, scattered all over the world, what's going to happen to the land? It's going to turn into a malaria-infested wilderness. Do you realize, every time the Jews are in their land, they prosper. It's a land of milk and honey. When the Jews no longer are in their land, it becomes a malaria-infested wilderness. Gentiles are occupying it, but they just trash it. And so that's all prophesied. The land would become desolate. The land would become waste. Moses put it very graphically when he said, the foreigner who comes from a distant land will say, all its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows in it. Can you imagine? If you've been to Israel, right? Some of you have been to Israel. It, it is a beautiful place. We're going to show some pictures here. Look at that. That's Israel today.
but when the Jews are out of their land. Notice the foreigner who visits. The land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive. No grass is even growing. But God in his marvelous grace promised he would preserve the Jew as a separate people during their worldwide wandering. He then adds that God cannot forget Israel because he has them tattooed on the very palm of his hand. God believes in tattoos. <laughs> I think they're disgusting, but anyway. It's... God has Israel tattooed on the palm of his hand. He will never forget the Jew. Why? Because Israel is his land. Remember what we said at the beginning. God is a nationalist. It's Israel first. So here are these Jews wandering all over the place being persecuted. Of course, the, uh, the final thing there was the Holocaust in World War II. This became a motivating factor, by the way, for Jews to start coming back to their homeland. The Old Testament prophets repeatedly said that the day will come when God will regather the Jews to their land of Israel. The prophets further stated that when the people were regathered, the nation of Israel would be reestablished. This occurred on May the 14th, 1948. This is one of the greatest miracles of modern history as Israel's dry bones came to life, as Ezekiel said, and they stood up on their feet as a vast army. This past May the 14th, Israel celebrated 70 years as a nation. And God has truly blessed them as a nation. They have turned a malaria-infested desert into a blooming paradise. Ezekiel put it like this. This desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. See that picture? That's the Garden of Eden. He promised to give them a strong military. Notice what Zechariah says. Their military will be like, flaming, like a flaming torch among sheaves. And they would consume all the people around them. Isn't that exactly what has been happening? Every time Israel is attacked, whoop, the enemy is blown up. And we're going to be talking, I don't know which week it is, maybe, uh, I don't know, it's next week, week after. We're going to be talking about Syria and the withdrawal of our troops from Syria. And, and what is that doing to the nation of Israel? What's happening in Syria? You will be shocked to know what's happening in Syria. Remember, the Russians are there. The Iranians are there. The Turks are there. We have a lineup in Syria right now for the Ezekiel 38, 39 battle. But that's coming. You, you have to come back. I'm not going to get into that now. <laughs> Invite somebody. we got a couple seats left. It is believed that this small nation of Israel has the eighth strongest military in the world. God promised once they returned to their land, their Hebrew language, which they lost in the dispersions, would be revived. You know that has happened? That was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah. During, during the Old Testament times, Hebrew was the official language of the Jew. And then when they got dispersed from one end of the earth to the other, they lost their language. And the Hebrew language hasn't been spoken for centuries. But once the Jews returned to their land, their language was given back to them. And so Hebrew, the Old Testament Hebrew, is the official language of the Jew today in Israel. Prophesied in the Bible. Jerusalem has always been the capital of Israel. It was the uh, capital uh, that was first made under King David. However, once Israel became a nation again in 1948, it wasn't long before Jerusalem became a focal point of world politics. The prophet Zechariah said, in the end times, Jerusalem will become, notice, Zechariah chapter 12, a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. Jerusalem will become a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. 
Once Israel captured East Jerusalem in the Six-Day War and united Jerusalem as one city, Jerusalem became a source of worldwide contention. One thing I, I missed here in the notes, but, but because it's critical. Remember what Jesus said? This is Luke chapter 21. Je Jesus said this. There's a time when the Gentiles are going to control Jerusalem. And then there's a time when the Jews are going to totally control the city of Jerusalem. That is what happened in the Six-Day War of 1967. Today, all of Jerusalem is under the control of the Jew. East Jerusalem, modern Jerusalem, it belongs to Israel. Jesus said that's a sign that we're coming near to the end. When the city of Jerusalem is united under Jewish control. See that? But you see, once it got united, what happened? Now Jerusalem becomes a heavy stone. Now it becomes a matter of political uh, warfare. Here's what's uh, happening right now. The Muslims claim East Jerusalem is the capital for the Palestinians. Now, why do they do that? Two reasons why they do that. Number one, because the Muslims, here's what Muhammad said, any time Islam conquers a nation, it always belongs to Allah even if it gets reconquered and somebody else takes it over. Well, there have been several times in history where the Muslims have had total control of what then was called Palestine or today Israel. And so Islam says, the whole land belongs to us. We conquered it. Here's the second reason. Now, Muhammad was never in Israel. Muhammad was never on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. He had a dream when he was in Saudi Arabia in the city of Medina. And here was his dream. He dreams he's on the top of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And there's a white horse that appears. And he gets on this white horse. And this white horse carries him all the way to heaven. And now he's having a conversation with Allah. That is sacred teaching in Islam. Temple Mount. Jerusalem belongs to the Muslims because, first of all, they conquered it at one time, and secondly, because of Muhammad's dream. Then you have the Catholic Church. They're making claim that uh, East Jerusalem, see, that's the holy city. You have the uh, modern city of Jerusalem. There's nothing sacred in, the, in modern Jerusalem. It's the East Jerusalem. That's the holy city. That's where the all of the uh, religious artifacts are. That's where the tomb is. That's where the Mount uh, Golgotha is located and so forth. So what the Catholic Church says is East Jerusalem needs to be under the control of the Catholic Church so we can preserve all the holy sites that are there. So the Catholic Church wants it. The United Nations has threatened to take the city of Jerusalem from the Jews and declare it an international city. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and believe me, he's in trouble over there. He may not be re-elected. We need to pray for this man. He says, Israel will never give up Jerusalem. She is our capital city and has been for 3,000 years. Do you realize that, that Israel is ready to shoot a rocket to the moon? That's how far their technology has come. And Netanyahu said this, we're going to take a copy of the Bible and we're going to place it on the moon. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the whole Bible is going to the moon. Huh. I don't know why I said that, but I just I did it. <laughs> Truly the words of the prophet Zechariah have come true. Jerusalem is a cup of staggering and a heavy stone to those who have tried to lift it. You see, Jerusalem is in the news all the time. I can remember when I was very young in the ministry. I'm, I'm, I'm back in the uh, early 60s, and I had a man in my congregation who said, Ron, I want you to keep your eye on Jerusalem. I, I didn't know any of this stuff then. You, know, you enter the ministry and you're still stupid. 
but I'm only 24 years of age at the time. And so anyway, this man comes up to me and he says, you need to keep your eye on Jerusalem. Read everything in the, it may just be a paragraph in the paper, but read what's going on in Jerusalem because the day is going to come when it will make headlines every day. We're living in that time right now. It was on Israel's 70th anniversary that President Trump recognized the city of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and immediately took steps to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And this move was immediately rejected by the European Union, who remains committed to a two-state solution as a peace settlement between Israel and the Palestinians. The EU solution is that Jerusalem is the capital of both. In other words, what they want to do, what? Divide the city of Jerusalem. East Jerusalem, hey, we'll give that to the Palestinians, even though all of our sacred holy sites are in that city. Islam has nothing except the Dome of the Rock. They have a mosque there and a shrine there. And, and we'll, let, we'll, we'll let Israel have modern Jerusalem. The general consensus of world leaders has been that Trump's decision to formally declare Jerusalem as Israel's capital is a hindrance to peace in the Middle East. But uh, we've not seen anything in this regard. Now, this is what's interesting. This April the 9th, President Trump is to present his peace plan for the Middle East. I am very curious as to what he is going to say. And I might interrupt a series that I'm starting in April or after each. I might just interrupt and do a whole hour on what he said. I don't know. We'll have to see. Real big. Hey, good. Now, here, here's what I would find hard to believe. Since he has recognized all Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, I can't believe he's going to want to divide the city. I can't believe he would recognize all Jerusalem and say, hey, let's divide the city. Let's bring Israel back to its 1967 borders which is the very thing that Macron of France wants to do, which is the very uh, peace plan offered by President Obama, which is the very peace plan that is offered by the United Nations. Jesus said what? Once Jerusalem is united and, and, and the Gentiles no longer occupy that city, it's totally in the hand of the Jews. Watch out! Your redemption draws nigh. Here's what we must never forget. Those who bless Israel will themselves be blessed. Remember what God said to Abraham. He was the father of the Jews. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Church, we need to stand behind the nation of Israel. Sadly, the belief that circulates among many churches today is what is called replacement theology. It simply means that because of Israel's disobedience, God has forsaken Israel, and the promises God made to Israel now belong to the church. Now, th th there is this passage, and I believe it to be true. It's 1 Corinthians 1.20. It's not in your notes. 1 Corinthians 1.20, which says this, All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. All the promises. What God promised to Israel, God can promise to the church as well. But God is not going to renege his promise he made to Israel because he made an everlasting covenant to Israel. And God never reneges on his promises. The writer of Hebrews said, he who promised is faithful. The uh, Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God has made a covenant with the Jews. He is a nationalist. That is his nation. He loves that nation. He's committed to that nation. And even though the Jews have turned their back on him, he's still faithful to his promise. 
Our responsibility is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. In the, the most recent broadcast that I saw from Amir Safarti, he's the head of the Behold Israel ministry. This, this will excite you. This will excite you. This, this, this is a good way to leave. He said, the Jewish people are rethinking who Jesus is. One Orthodox rabbi has written a book on the resurrection of Jesus. He believes that Jesus arose from the dead. But, there's a but. He believes that Jesus is only the Messiah for the Gentiles. And then he was asked, when Jesus comes back, what are you going to do? And his answer is, when he comes back, we might accept him too. <laughs> like, do you have a choice? Now, what is bringing about this new day of openness among the Jewish people toward the person of Christ? First, very important, they are realizing that evangelical Christians are their most cherished friends and not their enemies. Of all the friends that Israel had, which are not many, we evangelical Christians have been loyal to Israel. And now they're beginning to realize that. Secondly, there's a, there's a passage in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 5, that says this. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dresser. You know what's happening today? Christians from the United States are going over to Israel and assisting Jews in plowing their fields and in planting their vineyards. And in doing so, they're working right alongside the Jews and they're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. That is prophesied in the Bible. Did you see what Isaiah said? Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Who are the strangers? Gentiles. And the sons of the foreigners. Who are the foreigners? Gentiles. But believers shall be your plowman and your vine dresser. Paul wrote these words. For if the Gentiles have been partakers in their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. That's what's happening in Israel today. Christians are assisting the Jews and plowing their fields and planting their vineyards and assisting them in material things and sharing the gospel. So, I don't, I don't know what you think of President Trump. I, I don't care. But there are things I like and there are thing, you know, things I don't like. I suppose that's true with everybody. But I'll tell you this. President Trump made the right decision when he declared Jerusalem as the official capital of Israel and moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And God says, when we as a nation bless Israel, what is God going to do for us? He's going to bless us. And if we are going to curse the nation of Israel, we can expect to be cursed. Well, that's just the big. I just gave you three things today. We talked about the globalist movement. We talked about the nationalist movement. We talked about the breaking up of the European Union. And we've talked about what's happening in Israel. All of these things are very relevant in terms of when Jesus Christ is coming back again. I'm saying it can happen anytime. Amen? Amen. Okay. Uh, 